On a natural level, every human being lives in a perpetual conversation with himself when in solitude. The process of sanctification of the soul is one of learning to turn this conversation into one with God. Perfection is reached once the soul has learned to pray always, no longer in a conversation with oneself, but with God alone, even when externally conversing with men. We are now going to trace the footsteps of St. Margaret Mary Alacoque, one of the few persons to achieve this holy conversation with God. St. Margaret Mary was born on July 22, 1647, the fifth child of Monsieur Claude Alacoque and Mademoiselle Philibert Lamin. Margaret was known for having developed a strong horror of sin from the age of two or three. Margaret's love for the Blessed Sacrament was the predominant affection of her life from this young age. This was important for her future mission as a disciple of the Sacred Heart. She also had a tender love for Our Lady. When eight years old, Margaret's father died soon after the death of her godmother. After suffering these losses, our saint was given to the poor Clare nuns, where the seeds of her religious vocation were first planted in her heart. It was also here that she made her first Holy Communion, which turned her affections even more than before away from the world. For a time, Margaret had to return home to her mother and brothers to recover from a serious illness. She did not get better until she was given by her family to Our Lady, with a special promise to this Queen of Heaven that if she were to cure Margaret, Margaret would become one of her daughters. Margaret's time of recovery gave her much time to develop an even deeper love for prayer and suffering. Even as a young child, she fasted and slept on a hard board. She scourged herself and wore iron chains. Eventually, she began to visibly see our Lord as he appeared in his passion, but she innocently thought this was a normal encounter experienced by many. On turning 17, Margaret began to experience much conversation with society as her siblings sought out marriage partners for themselves. Consequently, falling into tepidity, she shortened her spiritual exercises. Margaret struggled for a time between falling into faults of vanity and then repenting by harsh penance, only to find herself relapsing again. One day, Margaret decided to go to a ball, which decision she later called her great sin. On returning home from the ball, Margaret found a great surprise, namely our Lord himself, visibly appeared to her as he was when scourged, and he scolded her for her vanity. She then proceeded to do much harsh penance in reparation. Regardless of Margaret's own miserable view of her search after worldly pleasures, she did not once commit a single grave sin and preserved her purity and baptismal innocence through it all. In fact, she did not once tarnish her baptismal innocence throughout her whole life. Soon after this, Margaret's mother began to show desire that her daughter find a husband. Note that as a little girl, Margaret had secretly consecrated her virginity to God. This desire of her mother resulted, therefore, in a three-year temptation to abandon her vocation. Our Lord rescued her and appeared to her as he was when wounded in his passion, and chided her for forgetting her vow of chastity that she made when a child by giving thought to abandoning her vocation. After some time, she finally concluded that she would enter the Visitation Convent founded by St. Jane Francis de Gentil and St. Francis de Sales. These nuns were called the Holy Marys, and the seeds of St. Margaret's special mission as an apostle of the Sacred Heart were already in this convent. As St. Francis de Sales made many references to the Sacred Heart of Jesus as the foundation of this community. The emblem he chose for the community was a heart, crowned with thorns and surmounted by a cross, with the names of Jesus and Mary at the center of the heart. Another name for these, uh, for these nuns was the Daughters of the Heart. St. Jane Francis would say that our Lord gave many gifts to other communities, such as seclusion or austerity, but to this community our Lord gave his heart. On May 25, 1671, at 23 years old, Margaret Mary Alacoque entered the convent of the Visitation Nuns in Paré. The most distinct devotions of the community were love for the Blessed Sacrament and the Holy Cross. 
One of the first instructions Margaret received from her superioress was to present herself before God in prayer as a canvas on which he could paint as he desired. This thought of being at God's total disposal brought her an even stronger desire than she conceived as a child to suffer. Margaret was very zealous in her penances. St. Francis de Sales himself even spoke to Margaret from heaven to scold her for her excessive penance, that is, penance performed outside the envelope of obedience. Our Lord told Margaret as she took the habit and entered the novitiate on August 25, 1671, that the two of them, Jesus and Margaret, were then in the state of betrothal. Margaret's spiritual consolations on this day were palpable to the other nuns, so that they saw she would one day become a great saint. The superiors had long noticed the seemingly singular holiness of Margaret. Her manner of prayer was rather different from the other novices. The superiors began to put her through a period of trial. They told her to meditate according to the method of the other novices and assigned her to assist the infirmarian so that she would stay busy and unable to enter into her periods of deep contemplation when left without work. Inevitably, since Margaret was far holier than the other novices, she found herself unable to pray like them, no matter how she tried. She was soon told to sweep the choir loft while the other nuns were at meditation. This, however, did not keep Margaret from conversing with her divine spouse, as she was not given to conversation with herself in solitude. Still, the biggest mortification was yet to come. When the other novices were preparing to profess their religious vows, Margaret was told she would not be permitted to profess her vows with them. The superiors did not doubt her sanctity, but her so-called extraordinary ways made them unsure of Margaret's vocation to this particular convent. This trial, however, only lasted three months, and she was then permitted to make her profession. During the retreat in preparation for her vows, she was still restricted in the amount of time allotted her for prayer in the chapel. She was told to take care of some animals outside so as to avoid spending all day in the chapel. On November 6, 1672, Margaret pronounced her religious vows. Jesus appeared to her and said, Up to this moment, I have been only thy fiancé. I shall henceforth be thy spouse. Now, having tasted the holiness of our saint, if you have been wondering when and if we would ever hear the messages we know she received from Jesus Christ about spreading devotion to his sacred heart, the first revelation was on December 27th, 1673. Let us hear this story from the very lips of the visionary. Quote, This, as it seems to me, is what passed. The Lord said to me, My divine heart is so passionately in love with men that it can no longer contain itself within itself the flames of its ardent charity. It must pour them out by thy means and manifest itself to them to enrich them with its precious treasures, which contain all the graces of which they have need to be saved from perdition. He added, I have chosen thee as an abyss of unworthiness and ignorance to accomplish so great a design, so that all may be done by me. He demanded, Margaret continued, my heart, and I supplicated him to take it. He did so and put it into his own adorable heart in which he allowed me to see it as a little atom being consumed in that fiery furnace. Then, drawing it out like a burning flame in the form of a heart, he put it into the place whence he had taken it, saying, Behold, my beloved, a precious proof of my love. I enclose in thy heart a little spark of the most ardent flame of my love to serve thee as a heart and to consume thee till thy last moment." A testimony to the truth of this message is the reaction of the visionary. Margaret's first response was one of humility, and she ran to her superioress to tell her what happened, but with an intense desire to confess only her sins. Another result of this vision was something not mentioned in the quote read above, an invisible wound in her side like the wound in the side of Christ. The second apparition was on an unrecorded day in 1674, but most likely during what was then the octave of Corpus Christi. Before hearing her own account of the apparition, note that she described elsewhere that Christ in this second apparition appeared as an angry and outraged spouse. In her words we read, Jesus Christ, my sweet master, presented himself to me. He was brilliant with glory, 
his five wounds shone like five suns. Flames darted forth from all parts of his sacred humanity, but especially from his adorable breast, which resembled a furnace, and which opening displayed to me his loving and amiable heart, the living source of these flames. He unfolded to me the inexplicable wonders of his pure love, and to what an excess he had carried it for the love of men, from whom he had received only ingratitude. This, he said, is much more painful to me than all I suffered in my passion. If men rendered me some return of love, I should esteem little all I have done for them, and should wish, if such could be, to suffer it over again. But they meet my eager love with coldness and rebuffs. Do you at least console and rejoice me by supplying as much as you can for their ingratitude? Unquote. On Margaret's claim of inability to fulfill his request, Christ responded, Fear not, behold, here is wherewith to furnish all that is wanting to thee. Then Christ's heart opened, and a flame came forth, as if to consume the visionary. Our Lord gave Margaret two special requests, one, to communicate every first Friday of each month for the expiation of man's sins, two, to rise between eleven o'clock and midnight of Thursday night to make a holy hour while prostrate on the ground for the same intentions. This time, Margaret Mary experienced even more humiliations than the first time, as the nuns thought she would die of a fever, which they did not know came of what she described as an interior fire burning within her. The superiors did not, at first, believe in Margaret's vision, but when Margaret was in bed of this rare fever, which no ordinary remedy could cure, the superiors asked her in the name of obedience to beseech a cure from God, and if granted, Margaret would be permitted to make the the holy hour and first Friday communion requested by our Lord. The miraculous cure was granted, but the superioress, even after the cure, she asked for did not remain at peace about the nature of the vision. She began questioning the authenticity of the vision until a certain priest, Father Claude de la Colombière, now canonized saint, came to the convent to preach a retreat. Christ told Margaret that he sent this priest for her. Under obedience to her superiors, Margaret related her visions to the priest, and he assured her they were from God. The third and last revelation happened on June 16, 1675. Our Lord said to her, Behold this heart which has so loved men that it has spared nothing, even to exhausting and consuming itself, in order to testify its love. In return, I receive from the greater part only ingratitude, by their irreverence and sacrilege, and by the coldness and contempt they have for me in this sacrament of love. And what is most painful to me is that they are hearts consecrated to me. It is for this reason that I ask thee that the first Friday, after the octave of the blessed sacrament, be appropriated to a special feast to honor my heart by communicating on that day and making reparation for the indignity that it has received. And I promise that my heart shall dilate to pour out abundantly the influences of its love on all that will render it this honor or procure its being rendered. Unquote. Father de la Colombière assured Margaret of the authenticity of this vision, and they both proceeded to consecrate themselves to the sacred heart of Jesus. She was soon after given a crown of thorns by Christ, which, although invisible, she felt in the form of a ring of fire around her head so that she could not even rest on a pillow. The nuns soon assigned her to help young girls in a boarding school, but she was so caught in contemplation all the time that she had to be removed from the assignment for her lack of attention at work. The children, however, did not mind her deep prayer and happily cut little relics away from her habit. Eventually, when a new superioress was elected, Margaret was given a more successful assignment, that is, to be the mistress of novices. She made many holy religious and left her devotion to the sacred heart of Jesus in each of them. Many professed religious wanted to return to the novitiate to receive the instructions of the saint. Before her death, she spread devotion to the sacred heart inside and outside the convent, from paintings to booklets to litanies, a little office of the sacred heart, processions, and chapels built in the honor of the sacred heart. The most important success was the establishment of the mass and feast of the sacred heart of Jesus. One last important message from Christ to Margaret was to tell the king of France to consecrate the country to his sacred heart. The king did not heed our Lord's request 
and the French Revolution resulted a century later. Margaret was nearing the end of her earthly life, and she would humbly say, I must die, for I am an obstacle to this sweet devotion, that is, the devotion to the Sacred Heart of Jesus. She even knew the time of her death as it approached. Margaret showed the gift of prophecy in other ways as well, even knowing who was in purgatory. She was not wanting in miracles either, as once, when a nun cut herself by accident with an axe, was too shy to reveal the wound. She touched it to Margaret's habit and was cured. Margaret eventually contracted the illness of which she would die. The doctor told her she would not die, but she responded, After all, it is less culpable for a secular than for a religious to tell a lie. When she asked for viaticum, the nuns unfortunately heeded the doctor's calming words so that the sacrament was not brought to her. She said she purposely received communion the day before, aware that she would be deprived of Holy Communion at death. When it became clear she was dying, a priest came to anoint her, during which she was taken to her heavenly mansion with the name of Jesus on her lips. This saint shows us the purity of heart and sensitivity to sin needed to enter into a perpetual conversation with God. St. Margaret Mary, pray for us.